So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome, Stefan. I'm Aoi Hasegawa, the program leader of the Masters in Interior and Living Design and Masters in Product Design at Domes Academy. Welcome to everyone. Um, so, Stefan, thank you very much for uh, being here with us today. Uh, later, we will see a beautiful uh, presentation of your projects and career, but I'm here to have a very short introduction of you. Uh, so it's very difficult to define Stefan Timely by just a single word, considering his multidisciplinary mature um, nature. Uh, he's a French architect uh, based in Paris, a set designer, a visual artist, and also a musician. Uh, he's a traveler of different disciplines and culture, focusing on the theme of temporality, memories, recollection and atmosphere. It's very impressive to see how he travels among these disciplines and visualize the immaterial aspect of the project by simple tools. Today, we will discover what brought him to have this multidisciplinary attitude and the key point of success. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this talk between Stefan and our students who are very curious to see and have a direct talk with you, Stefan. So thank you so much for your presence and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Aoi, for the invitation, uh, which uh, was a nice surprise in this uh, life path that I'm following since many years. But it makes sense. And I, I have often been um, coming back to Milano and the region around Milan. So it's uh, it's also a nice sign that maybe I should hang around there. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks for this uh, presentation. Um, I don't know if the, the students who are present have had the opportunity to see a little bit of the um, of my work here and there, but I will try to do this presentation in a um, kind of um, free flowing kind of way. Uh, showing some projects that I have participated and made in over the years, but mostly focusing on the theme uh, of of the conference, which is very interesting for me. When when I approached me with this idea of disrupt, disrupting patterns, um, it was challenging. Also, my own vision of like what I do and how I do it. I've. I don't consider myself so much of a disruptor or this kind of um, approach, but in a way. It, it it still is the way I'm doing the projects are, is are disrupting patterns uh, actually without really uh, trying to disrupt as a prime goal but that's what's happening uh, I notice so um, maybe I will just uh, after following this quick introduction uh, go straight into the the heart of the matter and I wanted to to introduce it with this idea of the sinuous path so the the road if we consider life uh, or work to be a road that is not straight, but that is going uh, in a sinuous pattern or in forking ways. Uh, it's just like the analogy I often use, and you will see that the idea of the road comes back a, a lot of times. Uh, you can either take the fast train, the Freccia somewhere, and then it's connecting two points in the most efficient, quickest, uh, most comfortable way, or you can decide to take the, the small uh, treni regionali or to walk and go around. And that's mo much more complicated <laughs> often, but, but it allows you to discover other things that you will not see if you stay on the Freccia. No? So this being said, so I, I will introduce myself with this uh, idea that my, my work is a sinuous line and it's a bit like the drawing line. Uh, there is a connection probably between the fact that drawing with the hand is often a sinuous pattern uh, as opposed to the digital vectorial uh, clarity the the hand is uh, has its kind of errands and um, and so i wanted to show you a, a few images that that kind of uh, take you along the way and that will take us from through all these disciplines that you mentioned that I'm dealing with on an everyday basis. So drawing and art and music and architecture, eventually theater also, and some other unexpected things. Um, yes, I, I'm introducing this, this little image. Uh, it's a sketch that I made in, in Puglia years ago, but it, it was 
a moment of little revelation you know when you you practice things every day you don't notice but some sometimes they make sense and this was a moment when it appeared that really drawing can be not only a kind of uh, thing to pass time or to just you know divert yourself but also it can be a kind of a very nice uh, scalpel like a like a tool to cut through reality and to dissect reality so to speak and i think as children we 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 draw to express stuff uh ideas to make a trace somewhere and as time passes it becomes more and more complex maybe the drawing but i like to retain this kind of idea that it's an encounter between the inner world and the outer world exactly on the on the page on the paper there there is a kind of filtering going on of reality but for me above all it's a tool to be um present in space time uh i feel like like drawing every day has been dr driving me since i was three years old i was quite lucky that my my dad uh who studied as an architect also he taught me some two rules of perspective when i was uh, a kid and so from age three or four, I was always drawing. They taught, they tell me, my parents tell me I was always drawing uh, everywhere. And so it, it just got like a second nature kind of thing to to draw things, to, to see them better, but also to reinvent them in a way. And this, in a way, the, the idea here is that the sinuous light path, no? Um, it's... A, it's a bit unexpected what's coming, but if you do one thing every day with passion, I think it eventually takes you somewhere. You don't know where, but it takes you somewhere. So that's why the the, the drawing as such is a is an important thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about disrupting. Uh, the first pattern I would like to to investigate how to disrupt it is is identity and how we are assigned oftentimes fixed identities or we are expected to deliver. Uh, a kind of clear identifiable identity and as I always said I've always struggled with this since my young age maybe because I'm uh, part of two very different families my my own background is like uh, my mother is from Vietnam and she came to France during the, the 60s during the Vietnam War on one side but my father is from Switzerland and Norway from Zurich so it's there it's two completely different cultures and so I've always been kind of trained to live between cultures, between languages, between landscapes. And so the, whenever, when I was little, people asked me, what, what are you? Are you, uh, are you Chinese? Are you French? Are you something? You know, they would try to, to give me my tag, no? And I was saying, no, I'm, I'm neither of these things. I don't know what I am, but I will find out. I don't know. So that on the identity level it is first in interesting to see where we stand and how we can be multiple things instead of one defined thing um of course the the tendency to have simple answers is is very human and especially i think in the world of media of information communication even graphic design or uh marketing that that i've heard usually People always told me, uh, forget all this complexity, just give us one story, like one one thing, one job, one personality, one country. That's much easier to, to broadcast. And that is true. It is, a, it is a rule of information that one simple information is more powerful than a thousand little things. No? However, I, I will uh, emphasize that this is the pattern I would like to disrupt, especially. Can we have simple things? simple ideas that respect the complexity of the living and that don't negate it and that you will maybe see this has been a constant kind of struggle in all my works and in a way drawing for me is the is one tool to do it that is you can deal with huge complexities you can synthesize it and make it a bit more simple and communicate it this is an an exhibition that uh, i made a few years ago at the school of architecture in versailles where they invited me, they were looking for architects who are still using their hand. <laughs> Apparently not so many <laughs> right now, as, as after 20 years of full on digital um, transformation of all the, our working tools, um, drawing has gradually be become this kind of uh, almost obsolete media that is uh, that has 
uh, it's kind of charm and flavor, but that, that is considered not really efficient anymore or relevant in many offices, in, in many contexts, in many competitions, there, there will be the incentive to say, uh, working by hand is a kind of thing of the past. And now we are in the 21st century and it's going somewhere else. No, uh, we, we have these tools that are so powerful, easy and, uh, and kind of super efficient. So why would you use this kind of old, old thing that is the hand and the pencil? But here, uh, this exhibition was exactly about that. What can you still do with the hand? That makes sense. And this is a collection that you see, it's a bit chaotic. It's a big table with plenty of things. And some of our architecture projects, other are theater set design projects, and other are just drawing free form artwork. And there's even some music records there. The common link between all this mess is that there is a hand drawing in there that is at the core of each project lies the acts of drawing in a certain way with certain decisions and um, this was i intended this exhibition to not be so clear and simple but to look more like a messy atelier workshop table uh, as it is in in reality it's often like this the table is not so clean things kind of merge with each other so it's a kind of exhibition where you would have to put your head into each thing to really understand what's going on but then noticing that there is hand drawings over the architecture models, there is hand drawings over the surfaces of these set designs for theater, and there's hand drawings everywhere in the artwork of the music uh, little booklets, which I will show you later. So I'm going to start with visual arts because that's kind of the this route uh, from where uh, where all, all the rest stems from. In a way, for me, I see it this way that the simple, very simple, almost childish act of drawing can be the root of a tree that then has branches. And these branches can go to architecture through atmosphere. So these, these are photographs that I made from my Swiss side. This is my Swiss village in the mountains, uh, shot with pinhole cameras for an entire night, seven hours long exposure in the snow. Or this is a quick image taken in my other side in Vietnam, in the country of my mother, uh, uh, on, a, on the first time I, I visited this country. And, um, and it's also a very architectural uh, image, speaking about color, presence, and light, and the human scale within it. So the drawing has been a constant experimentation. And honestly, I don't know where I'm going with the drawing. I have some ideas, but it's more like gymnastics of the mind and the hand. I consider drawing to be as important as some physical exercises to do or eating or you know thinking. It's just a way to, to process uh, space time through your life. Life material becomes traces on paper. Here, uh, studies of human expression at var various scales um, levels of transparency, studying the morphology of, of humans, but it, uh, beyond all the, the emotion that lies behind uh, the shape of their mask, so to speak. And I, uh, I have a lot of these sketchbooks. Usually humans always mingle and merge with architectures. On one page, there's an architecture like this, which you know, probably the Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza, a long drawing to make. It's a moment when, when drawing becomes a really nice excuse to just sit there for a few hours and just become part of the place. Because you can't just, you can go and make a quick sketch, but with this kind of very precise and complex architecture, the beautiful thing is that drawing forces you to melt down into the atmosphere of the place because you have to sit there for so long and let your eye wander in every detail. Uh, same thing here for this Corbusier building in, in uh, Chandigarh. Uh, the chance of music tourists took me there in, in India. And so I, I visited this incredible ensemble of buildings by Corbusier in Chandigarh. This is the National Assembly. And I, I had the sketchbook, but then I found this found piece of paper on the floor that is actually a legal file document that was abandoned. 
So I, I st started sketching there. The fact that it's a found object, obviously, with all these scriptures from the legal firms um, acting there was very important. It, this is how drawing forces you, in a way, to pay attention to very little details. And the, the, this is bringing us to the theme of memory and space-time. I consider that making one page every day, uh, which is what you see here, these are sketchbooks. So I always have this sketchbook in my pocket and each day is going to be a page. It's a, it's a kind of metaphor, obviously, that each page you turn is like a day you pass. You know, And then if you look at all these pages, you have a block of life in a way. It's a bit melancholic to see how fast it's going in a way, I, I must admit. But it's also for me beautiful to process it in this way, to say that life deposits a trace on each page and it's like a reminder of space-time being lived. Observations, as you see, vary from scientific studies to very atmospherical or quirky remarks about the people. It, it's also for me, a tool to always have to look at the people around me. And often when I'm here in the Paris metro, I see people looking at the screens of their cell phones, obviously, uh, most of them. And so I'm thinking in these moments, I, I prefer to have this piece of paper because I can look at all the faces of the people around me. And it feels a bit less uh, alienating, I must say. It's a great tool to connect, even if they are foreigners and unknown people, I have the feeling that somehow I spent five or 10 minutes with them because I, I was just studying their gestures and their faces. And that's very precious. In, uh, in terms of traveling and uh, memory organizing, this, the, the, for me, where it's going is to make these books. Th these are books that I find on the, on the road, on the way, traveling. I pick them up in small bookstores or something. And I, there is a series that I make on the um, former republics of the Soviet Union, uh, territories that were on the Eastern Bloc, like Armenia here, where faces of people are deposited in these old Russian language books from the Soviet times. Uh, or this one in Estonia, that is actually an electrical manual but uh, the views of Estonia, of Tallinn, become merged with these machines from this industrial age of the Soviet era. So this is, for me, this is a very meaningful work that I want to pursue, to try to travel, meet people through drawing, uh, touch memory. And this takes me to this point here, um, which I will call the art of spatial memory. I, I went into architecture, and as I, I introduced me, I'm mainly an architect. If, if I have to choose a kind of label, this is my main job in a way, my prime job. And I graduated as an architect from the Academia of Mendrisio and the School of Paris Belleville after completing a degree in interior architecture in the ENSAD, Art Décoratif School in Paris. So mostly I did 10 years of studies in architecture, and I finished them by some nice um, twist of chance in, in Mendrisio, so not far from Milan, maybe you know the Academia di Architettura there. When I was there, uh, it was a chance thing that my cousin told me there is this uh, Swiss architect called Peter Zumthor, who is her teacher, and he's giving these classes that are unlike any other, in very experimental, very sensitive. Uh, and for me, it was a big, um, uh, motivation because I, Peter Zumthor was the only architect I read in his books that spoke about memory, reminiscence, and how time and matter come together. So I was driven to go there just on that purpose to, to kind of be able to meet somebody who is teaching how to use memory and time as a building material, really. Uh, also, the, the idea of atmosphere was central, and this really, in a way, changed my life. These two years of studies I did in, in Enrico, this is my degree project that I made with, with uh, Peter Zumthor. Uh, so that's back in 2003. It's a project merging theater and architecture, because back then I was already working in the theater field as a set designer, and I wanted to use that experience to make this degree project. So what you're seeing is a map of seven little teatrini, little theaters around the ring railroad of Paris. It's like a family of 
of theaters. Uh, each one is a very small teatrino, but together they form a big theater that is scattered around the city. And each theater has the same building code. And this is something we worked a lot with Peter Zumthor and that was extremely interesting in that the question is, how can you make an idea so clear and simple that it, it stands on its own? So a very clear, very simple idea, but with a very complex materiality making it exist with the richness of things happening inside. So the simplicity of the concept does not negate the richness and complexity of life within. On the contrary, they enforce each other. So here you see the concept is quite simple. It's a big void, but all the walls of this theater have a double thickness and they allow for secret passages everywhere. Every wall, every ceiling, every floor is a secret passage. The public doesn't see it because the public enters the space and just sees large, simple shoot through spaces. But the staff, the actors, the technicians, they know the secret passages. And so they can go anywhere. They have these shortcuts within the walls. So in a way, this, this project was also a kind of how to tell a story with architecture. It's a very narrative thing, this uh, idea of the secret passage, of, of course. So this is a very simplified spatial concept um, model, negative and positive, that shows the spatial structure of the building. But then the actual building is built in a very materialistic way, just like theaters are. Wood that co gets con constantly repainted, changed, reused. Uh, public that can swap places, that can sit either here or there, or be influenced by the by the show that is going on. And so these are these atmospherical pictures also that we made uh, in the Atelier Zumtor in, in Mendrisio that are not very precise. They are a bit uh, improvised, but they have this strong architectural and ar atmospherical content. And to us, this was also a way to say, we make things with our hands. We build images with our hands. Uh, we don't entirely rely on 3D renders or machine generated um, uh, materials. We deal with the actual smell, touch, and weight of the materials. And so uh, this is this was a very olfactive model. It was uh, smelling like the this um, ink for the for the wood. Also, uh, Peter Zumthor was always asking us a lot of information and engagement, investing time and energy into proving the materiality of our projects. And so this, for my diploma degree project, we ha I had to, to build this one-to-one -one piece of the building with actual finding the bricks, the geometry of the joints, of course, I was helped by two of my architect friends because that was a lot of work to do on, on my own. And so, but this was the type of engagement that was asked for us. And I, I really am very grateful to this uh, huge energy that uh, Peter Zumthor was uh, asking for us to, to produce. Uh, you can see here the collective effort. <laughs> Everybody has their hands black. We were always kind of full of pigment. And this is the Mendrisio Times, <laughs> some old memories that I found when uh, Aoi asked me to speak about this experience uh, back then with uh, Zumthor at the Academia. You can see there is Zumthor and Snozzi here in the, this is the graduation uh, jury, a uh, long time ago with Aurelio Galfetti, who is now gone, but he was the uh, father of that school in a way. Um, and this was very formative time. I then got the chance to uh, work for Peter Zumthor briefly in Helsinki for uh, this uh, project here, this housing project, a very intense, full on day and night uh, kind of work, uh, generating plans entirely by hand. He insisted on that, that we should draw everything by hand to feel this, the scale of each space. And these are huge plans. These are A0 a format plans that we made uh, over one night with uh, the assistant. <clears throat> on this project. But this was for me a very interesting and strong time to be able to um, absorb a lot of ideas and ways to work with uh, Peter Zumthor. Now I'm jumping to these years, still talking about architecture. This is a new project that is still unbuilt. It's in the process. We should build it soon. 
it's a studiolo, so a small, also kind of retreat, but a very small cabin made of wood for a musician. I met this musician through my other life as a musician, and he asked me if I can think of a place to compose music, record some music, but an inspiring place that is in the mountains of Vosges in uh, Eastern France, in Alsace. Um, so I, I designed this very small kind of uh, essentialist kind of cabin, just a, like one big roof and a small room. It's 20 square meters just for one or two people to compose music together. The whole volume is shaped according to the site and the climate. So the steep slopes of the roof that resemble all these traditional chapels and farmhouses there. But the inside, of the space is shaped by the acoustics, the fact that it's a musician's retreat. So in, in effect, this is just like one big instrument. I, I play the double bass, as you notice, maybe I have it here. And the, for me, the double bass is a beautiful instrument because you can almost enter inside it. In size, you could fit inside the double bass. And so this drives to an analogy that I will speak about later between architecture and musical instruments buildings and musical instruments they have this strong connection and here you see in these drawings i was trying to explore how to draw this building like huge instrument where the the sound bounces off the walls and gets amplified in some ways or projected in others always working with models with actual wooden simple models that give you the light and the atmosphere they vibrate and they are very imper imperfect, but I appreciate the imperfection and the poetics it has. Eventually, this project became a big model, and this is a 1 to 10 scale model made of chestnut wood of this same project, showing the inside geometry of the space, the light, and we took it to the site. So you are seeing this model exactly where it is supposed to be built. The actual thing should be built 10 times bigger. But then we noticed it that the model was big enough that, so that birds can be living inside. So we finally decided to, to leave it there on the site to, uh, to just stick it on the wall up there, seven meters high, so that eventually falcons or owls that are living in the valley could maybe use it as a nest. So it's still there and, and we are waiting <laughs> to see if some birds will like the shelter and start to, to go inside and to make their nest within it. So it's also a crossover between architecture and some kind of living art for me. This, this project is, is a very experimental and nice project for that purpose. Also the discipline of making the project is essentially here, as you see, handmade. All the shapes and the geometries are tested through wax models or wooden models inside and outside before eventually settling on the details and actually building the, the engineering of the structure uh, to, to give it some precision. <laughs> but that's all coming from this more uh, handcrafted kind of research. Then I, I switch to this uh, second chapter in a way, that is the life on the road. So after all these years studying architecture, memory, how to build things. It's a very kind of stable, for me, architecture is a kind of slow moving and something looking for stability. Um, music, on the other hand, is something very fluid, very quick. Uh, when you make music, it vanishes as soon as it is produced. And for me, it has always been a double life that I was making architecture in the daytime, playing music or making theater in the nighttime. And eventually, when my band Moriarty uh, started recording the first album, something happened that kind of took me by surprise, took us all by surprise, because this album had so much um, uh, success in a way in, in the world that we started being called to, to tour in all of Europe, then America, then Japan, India, Australia. And then we, it was not, never stopping. We just were touring for 10 years. Uh, starting with this album here. Um, we made something like 800 concerts around the world in this period of time. 
roughly between 2007 and 2016, 17. So uh, it was a kind of very chaotic moment because in music, you never know what's going to happen the next day and so on. So you learn to live there. You learn to live on the road, to connect with people, uh, but to, to kind of go one day in one city, the next day in another city and so on and so on. So it's exactly the opposite of architecture where usually you're staying much more stable. Here, music is like this constant traveling. And for us, making songs in a way was the energy of traveling within the music. Also, in all these years, I tried to keep a hand on the graphic design of the album. So all that you are going to see here is the graphic design artwork production that I made um, between the recording sessions. I would use collages like this, telling the story of the album. So our first album like this, they are postcards sent from another space time. So you can see that the whole artwork is made out of postcards and letters. But the second album is more like a film noir, like a thriller kind of movie soundtrack. So there I switched to another kind of graphic design, much more uh, bichromatic, dark. And you will notice everything is also done by hand. This is for a good reason. My band at that moment decided to use only acoustic instruments to refuse all sorts of electronic instruments. And also we started to record on analog tape. This was an attempt to kind of find the soul of the music, the, the center of music, the core of emotion within the music without getting too much carried away with all the electronic sounds that were happening around us. So I decided that the artwork which in a way is kind of the visual manifestation of music. It is the architecture around a record, is, is the artwork, uh, should be done by hand also with the same discipline. So everything is uh, typed on an old typewriter or handwritten. All the illustrations are drawn by hand. And each vinyl record is unique. It contains uh, original hand drawings that I was producing by the hundreds so that each record buyer would have a, their own version of the record that is unique, that has an original drawing inside done by the band. And this was a kind of philosophy that we always kept, that we said we, we make our own record label and we have this philosophy behind the record label that records are made slowly with cure, patience and with a lot of uh, richness of materials. You see, we choose a material for each record the former one was in fabric. This one is in rough cardboard. And it's full of drawings and hidden stories and even some enigmas uh, uh, hidden within the artwork. For people who are curious, they can look, listen to the songs, but dive into the lyrics and open the, the booklet and they find another story that is hidden, that is like a treasure hunt enigma story, a secret kind of story hidden within the record. And this is a constant in all of our records. We always try to put as much uh, richness as we as we could into the music. And the, my band decided to take a big break uh, in 2016 and 17 to do other things with our lives. After 10 years of touring, we decided we should have a big break. And this is what happened. We we left all the songs that were not released. We put them in little boxes and we buried them in 14 places around the world, secret places, <laughs> very meaningful ones. And it was the fans of, our, of the band, following the band that had to decipher some enigmas to travel to these places, unearth the boxes, and there they could find on a little USB flash drive the secret songs that nobody has heard. So this was kind of a little farewell uh, present that we were trying to do, but also to build a link with our listeners that we are not just, we didn't want to be a band that is just putting the music on Spotify and say bye-bye, but we wanted to be to have this kind of very physical kind of relationship. And so in the meantime, I, I, I directed this project that's uh, triple vinyl records with all the uh, material that we recorded over 10 years of touring. What you see here in the artwork, I tried also this memory thing <laughs> to, uh, 
to find every single concert that the band has played in 10 years. And that's 800 concerts on the same page in the inside of the vinyl. So this was also an attempt that all the people who have seen us in concert, they can look in all this little timetable and they can find the day that we actually met. Um, the touring was another experience. And there I go back to architecture and other areas. As you see, this was a concert in New York. This one is in Ronchamp, in the Corbusier built Ch Chapelle de Ronchamp. And this was a very meaningful moment where music could encounter architecture. Uh, for me, acoustically, this was a revelation. And uh, emotionally, it was incredible because I love this building and the ability to play music inside is a unique kind of way to dialogue with the architecture. Very different from an architectural point of view where you study composition, shapes, concepts. When you're a musician, it's very direct. You just play there and you hear the sound and you are you become one with the building. So it was a very important and very meaningful way to say it's important to cross the borders, to not remain just an architect or just a musician, but to be one and the other. I switch now to the theater side, that is the other kind of living art that I practiced over these years. I was always making these set designs that I will show you with a colleague of mine, a friend whom I studied with in the art school in Paris, and my friend Marc Lenné. Uh, you can read it somewhere here, I think, down there. A vanishing Point, written and directed by Marc Lenné. Marc Lenné is a scenographer and playwright and stage director. And uh, I'm his collaborator now in the Comédie de Valence Theatre in Southern France, where he's the director. And together we made all these kind of experiments on stage. Here, we designed this set design like a cinema studio where we are shooting a movie in real time every night. We shoot the movie that you can see on the screen, but nothing is pre-recorded. Everything is made live, including the music, which I wrote with my band. You can see us in the background playing like in a garage a corner, but you see all the special effects like the fake snow with the ventilator, all the lightings. This is, everything is done live and the audience can see a road movie on the screen, but they can also see at the same time how it is being made in front of their eyes. This became a record that just was just released. And what you see down there is a tool for managing multidisciplinary work. So I often get asked, how do you, what's, what's the tool that you can use if you want work as an architect, as a theater designer, as a musician, what's the connection, you know, how do you do it? And I, one of my answers is using the hands and very simple things like a drawing like this. This is the timeline of the show. So you have like a, about one hour of music there. And there is a line in the middle that is like a landscape. And this is actually the energy of the music. It is a kind of um, mental device for me to, to visualize the music like a landscape. So I know where I am, if I'm on a peak or a valley or a plateau. And that is kind of helping me to direct the music, to know at which part we are in the, in the global travel. So it also becomes the artwork that I made for the record. It's showing the, the artwork is about showing how the record is made, how the music is composed. And here, so this device, this timeline, I do these things for almost every project. I try to make a mental mapping of these invisible things, but to put them on paper in a very simple way with a pencil. And it helps me to structure it and to understand the relationship between, for example, space and time. Because on this timeline, the upper uh, line is about music and time, and the lower line is about the travel in kilometers and space. And in a way, you can see here how time becomes space or space becomes time. Right? They, they merge within one thing. So I will show really quickly, uh, because I see time is running, uh, a few of these uh, set design projects Together with Marc Lenné, we have set up a, a studio that's called La Boutique Obscure. 
And over the course of 20 years, we've, we've um, done something like 70 or 75 uh, projects of theater that have been built um, in France, Switzerland, Belgium. Oftentimes, the, the work goes like this with these sketches, these conceptual plans, these atmospheres that I do by drawing. And then we materialize them on stage with the teams that build it in real uh, real uh, scale. Uh, some set designs like this are very architectural. They use the video or the cinema aspect and they twist it. And so you see, we often make these very precise models so that the builders know exactly what to build. And in the models, we can experiment already with the little camera. And my friend writes the dialogues using the model uh, as a kind of uh, base. This is what becomes then real on stage. This was a show about thrillers and the emotion of fear. As you can see, it is inspired by thriller movies. This is now the direction I'm heading to the final uh, um, chapters. It's about how drawing can bring everything together. Uh, this is a set design for Comédie Française. So the main theater here, uh, classical theater in Paris, Comédie Française, and they asked us to do a very simple, cheap uh, scenography on a very small stage. So we designed this kind of background, just it's a wooden box, but all the poetry is coming from the drawings because we painted these drawings. You can see down there, down at the right, it is a model, one to 25 scale model that I painted by hand with ink on wood. And then we asked the team to help us to to do it in real life, 12 meters uh, wide drawing. This is a kind of a way that drawing always finds its way into all these disciplines. Uh, in large scale, like here, this is a scenography for the Théâtre des Célestins in Lyon. It's about recreating the universe of the Renaissance. And so they asked me to do these huge charcoal drawings that would be on stage huge backgrounds where you can see a, a huge painting of a battle, the Battaglia di Lepanto being made, but you can see gradually throughout the show, you can see the composition, abstract composition of the drawing, the directions of dynamics becoming elements that slowly become boats, and masts and linear elements until finally they become the battle with all its complexity. And here again, you see this kind of um, encounter between simplicity and complexity. I finished this theater, this theater chapter with this transdisciplinary work that's very precious for me. It's called Zilan. It's a sonic musical scenography. You see it's a mobile opera stage and the little cage you see is supposed to be a prison cell in the story, but actually it is a musical instrument that has special tunings. So we built this in Lyon and when the actor is singing there, he's like in a prison cell, but the musicians, they can come and they can play on these strings. So the, the prison bars, they become actually instruments. And here, this is really a connection between building architecture and making music. So here we see we are tuning the scale of the strings, the tension, and there I'm trying with the bow of the double bass to, to play it like an instrument. And it really sounds quite nice, actually, this instrument, because it has a large scale. Now, for uh, I will conclude with these things about drawing. For me, drawing is so precious that it it demands to be um, taken to places where it's on the edge. Like this is a project we're making with Marc Lenné, who you see here in the, in the picture, talking to senior citizens in a retirement home. And we did this as a social project of uh, uh, working with these senior, isolated senior citizens. And I'm drawing in real time their memories. They have to tell us the memory of a place that they lost and I have to draw it just by guessing from their words. So it's a kind of game. Are we able to make a drawing of something we cannot see? 
that we can just hear. But these old people, actually, they still have some pretty good memories of some places, very precise. So we managed to do a series of nice um, visualizations of what is hidden inside their brains. You can see here these old ladies, they are laughing because they're looking at the image of their memory that we exhibited in these little boxes. And this is the same principle maybe that you saw in the motionless travel sketchbook done during the lockdown, where I was drawing from my lockdown room, which is here, the imagination images of unknown people who called me through Skype. The game was to guess what is hidden inside their head. So here drawing is not only an illustration, drawing is a research to, to connect two minds together. Each page of the sketchbook is a different person calling me and telling me his place. And here I have to draw without any photograph, of course. I have to rely only on the indications of the people. So I will end here because we are already 40 minutes, 48 minutes into the presentation. So I will conclude with this um, uh, idea of mnemotopy. Uh, so you see here, this, this is a neologism that I made. I invented this word that means that the fusion of space and place and memory. And you see here this diagram, this plan. This is my mental studio. It's where I, it's a building that doesn't exist, but that I use in my head uh, imaginatively to connect my projects. There is one room for architecture, one for music, one for theater. In the middle, there is a room for drawing and all these functions and disciplines, they can merge within each other. So I put all my projects that I'm working on in this map. And in this way, I kind of, kind of have a kind of image of where I am at this moment. And it, it is a machine in a way, a mental machine to, to put things together. Still working every day with these uh, sketchbooks, uh, drawing by memory. These are memories of concerts. And now materializing, this is the, the atelier that I built actually as a model to help me to visualize and memorize it. So this is what we call a teatro della memoria. It's a theater of memory. It is a mnemonic device to help you to remember things, but also to structure your mental landscape. And so I finish with this project that is happening now. It is a uh, still kind of secret uh, images, but we, we are doing this with Fondation Carmignac, which is a contemporary art foundation. And we want to take art within the hospitals in France. So I'm designing this mini theater that is actually like a furniture you can open. And inside it will have uh, all the works of art contained in a box so that the people isolated in the mental hospitals, they can still see um, uh, contemporary art being brought to them, to their bed. And with this, so I end this little presentation, this little uh, panorama and this sinuous road through many things with this idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. It was very impressive for me also to see the, the whole process of your project. And it was very interesting um, that you often start from very immaterial uh, aspects or, or concept, but you end up having very concrete and physical materials. While um, in our current world, we, we tend to tackle very material or commercial concrete thing, but em end up having just digital, uh, an intangible material. So it was a very um, interesting uh, process. And I, I see uh, a, a very strong identity in your uh, project, um, also in terms of the process and um, conceptualization and how you visualize your idea. So thank you very much. Um, and very, um, I hope to see you very soon in person. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank Goodbye, you so much. everyone. Goodbye, Stefan. Goodbye, students. Thank you. A presto. A Ciao. presto. Ciao.